to the eighth lecture in the Brodsky series for the conservation of library materials. Today's speaker is Lois Alcott Price from the Winter Tour Museum. And introducing her will be Terry Harris, who will also talk a little bit about the Breuer Digitization Project, which we are wrapping up this year, and which was very significant in terms of the workflows, its mass scale digitization, but also in terms of pulling together materials from other collections. So I'll let Terry talk about that, and welcome and thank you all for coming. So I'd just like to reiterate what Peter said and say uh, thank you all for coming. Welcome to the Brodsky series for the advancement of library conservation. Um, today, Lois Alcott Price will be talking about the fabrication and preservation of architectural drawings. The topic was chosen, as Peter mentioned, uh, to coincide with the completion of this first phase of the Marcel Breuer Digital Archive, which is an NEH-funded project that will make many of the architectural drawings from the Marcel Breuer papers available online. So I just want to kind of use this opportunity to put a quick plug in for the website. It's under construction now, but this is the home page for the website. And for those of you who don't know anything about Breuer, I'll just say five seconds worth. He was um, an incredibly important furniture designer and architectural designer, um, started his career at the Bauhaus and then made his way to become one of the major practitioners of mid-century modernism in America. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to finally process the collection, which we'd originally received, I think, in the mid to late 1960s, and then also to take that next step and make those images, letters, all of the drawings that we could uh, available online. So we'll be launching it, I think, officially in December and having a larger event sometime in the spring semester, and then you'll all be able to play with it to your heart's content. Um, and those of you who are able to attend the workshop that uh, Ms. Price is giving tomorrow will also be able to look and work with some of the Breuer drawings firsthand, so that'll be a wonderful opportunity. Lois Alcott Price is Director of Conservation and Senior Conservator of Library Collections at the Winter Term Museum in Delaware. She holds a Master of Science degree in Art Conservation with a focus, I believe, on paper conservation, and also serves as an Assistant Winter Term Professor in the Program of Art Conservation. She holds another Master's in American Material Culture from the University of Delaware. Before arriving at Winterthur, she was an intern, I believe, at the Library of Congress and worked her way up to senior conservator at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, a nonprofit regional center in Philadelphia. Professor Price has, been a, has a long-standing interest in the fabrication and preservation of American architectural drawings, resulting most recently in this book, which I've got a copy of right here, Line, Shade, and Shadow, the Fabrication and Preservation of Architectural Drawings. Um, which, if any of you are interested in your own copy, I believe can be purchased at the back of the room after the lecture. It is. <laughs> um, so please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Lois Alcott Price. Yes. Okay. Testing. So I'm delighted to be here today. Um, when Peter asked me to uh, come up and talk, I thought, oh, this will be delightful. It will be fall. I love upstate New York. Uh, then, of course, he warned me that we might have snow on the way, but it seems to have bypassed us for the most part. And it's lovely to be here in any case. Um, I also thought that I might have. Um, students here. There are a few. So I thought I would first start out talking a little bit about conservation in general, uh, just because it's something that is sort of an esoteric feel. A lot of people don't know too much about it. Um, and it's something my students uh, at Winnetar have asked me, you know, how did you get involved in this research? You know, what, what's with you in architectural drawings and architecture? Aren't you a book, you know, a paper and library conservatory? So those are all good questions, and I'm thinking perhaps um, somewhat related to some you might have, though, from a different perspective. 
So since um, I kind of have you as a captive audience, particularly any students, I'm going to talk about conservation, which is a field I've loved and worked in for, you know, going on 30 years. Uh, if it sounds like a plug for a recruitment or a uh, infomercial, um, could be. Uh, if I pique your interest, uh, please talk to me after afterwards. It's a great field. So I'm going to say conservation is a really, it's a small, but it's an incredibly diverse profession. It's really become very international in scope. Um, it's populated by individuals with a pretty passionate interest in what they do, and it's something that's taken me all the way from, you know, the um, shores of the Gulf after Hurricane Katrina and helping to do re re relief work there for cultural heritage collections to more recently uh, helping to um, <clears throat> found and work with an uh, conservation training program in Iraq. This is actually in Kurdistan, which is in northern Iraq. Uh, it's called art conservation just because if you say conservation to many, many people, they think, you know, Smokey the Bear and Redwoods and wilderness preservation, all, all really good things, um, but certainly not, not art conservation. So I'm going to scroll through some slides. These are various uh, things that our students have worked on over the last several years, and they're wonderfully diverse. Um, everything from a bitumen funeral boat from Ur, which you see on the upper left, um, to uh, C-3PO, you'll see later, large murals, a Damascene ceiling, an Apollo space suit, and George Washington saddlebags have all come through the labs at Winnetar recently. Our conservation actually deals with many materials and issues that aren't normally thought of as art. Um, you know, art sort of calls to mind, you know, paintings, frescoes, old master drawings, porcelain sculpture. Um, but conservators work with these materials, but also with human skeletal remains of an indigenous people, natural history specimens, um, historic adobe structures, digitization projects for burnt books, waterlogged wood, and even rock paintings uh, from Aboriginal people in Australia. So it's pretty varied. So I can say in short, we really deal with the fabric and foundation necessary for the study of material culture. All those pieces of our collective human past really not embodied in the printed word, much as we all love and respect the printed world. You know, how do you put the light and texture of a Winslow Homer watercolor or the metallurgical sophistication of a Chinese bronze into words? The object itself speaks so much more eloquently. It also can speak for people who otherwise have no voice. Uh, think of slave cabins that have survived on southern plantations and quilts of otherwise illiterate Appalachian women during the Depression. Um, it's also about ensuring that these artifacts continue to speak to us as accurately and eloquently as possible. And unfortunately, of course, they all deteriorate with time. Looking back to chemistry and the, the concept of entropy, which is something I find endlessly interesting as a concept, which is the tendency of all matter to move towards increased randomness and a lower energy level. Now, most cultural artifacts are highly ordered constructions. You know, metals refined from ores, marble quarried from mountains, purified cellulose fibers become paper, uh, baskets made of reeds that if they hadn't been harvested would have just deteriorated um, and rotted. Uh, to support growth in the next season. So entropy means basically the metal corrodes in an effort to return to the ore. Wind and rain erode the Parthenon, paper becomes brittle, and the basket collapses as the cellulose fibers decompose. Now before I make this all too terribly depressing, I can say conservation, we can't change the principle of entropy, but we can really slow it down. Sometimes we can slow it down a lot. Um, so, a knowledge of chemistry and technology and the culture that formed each object helped prescribe the environments, the storage enclosures, the research and repair techniques that can stabilize uh, artifacts. So, if you really like problem solving, if you really like diversity, um, and enjoy critical thinking, um, it's a great field and the kind of things you get to do um, are so varied that I can honestly say I've very seldom been bored. Whoop. There we go. So I can say conservatories usually specialize in one type of material, be it paintings, textiles, photographs, archaeological materials, or even natural history collections, or now library collections. Uh, my specialty has been paper, uh, books, 
library and archival materials, and I've worked on some really amazing objects. I got to work on one of the drafts of the Declaration of Independence in Jefferson's hand. I've worked on both uh, copies, U.S. copies, of the Treaty of Paris that ended the American Revolution, and they have been truly inspiring. Mm, but the things that have really intrigued me the most have been architectural drawings. And so following my graduation from um, the <clears throat> program at Winneter, I took a job at the Conservation Center, which has already been mentioned, and that's kind of where the Odyssey began. Um, the Conservation Center is a nonprofit regional center. It services institutions up and down the East Coast and really the eastern half of the U.S and specializes in paper-based materials. So my long-standing interest in architectural drawings, a few sad examples here, really dates from a passion for building things as a kid. Just always liked building things. And ended up doing an undergraduate honors thesis in the social and cultural significance of 19th century American architecture. And also, as my husband will attest to, have occasional near accidents when I see interesting chimneys and gables alongside the road. So it's sort of a bit of an, an obsession. And this predilection really intersected a revived interest in architectural drawings among cultural heritage institutions late in the 1980s. When working at the Conservation Center, we saw more and more of these coming in for assessment, for treatment. The resulting exhibitions and collection activity just seemed to increase the flow of them. And we saw them in various stages of deterioration, as you can see here. And it also brought in architects with as-built drawings. Um, as historic preservation also came more and more into its own. People were getting tax credits and so on for taking care of historic buildings, and it's so much less expensive to be able to use existing drawings than to have to do new measured drawings. So it was always like, we need these shredded blueprints yesterday so we can get them copied, fix them. Uh, so we, we, we did that too. Some of them were really in appalling condition. So, but architectural drawings, as we found out, as we were called to go out into various institutions and do survey work, since the center does a lot of consulting, they were the parts of institutions in the, we don't know what to do with these parts, so let's pretend they don't exist. We just, you know, they're just too challenging. We found them rolled and stuck into cardboard tubes, in barrels in the backs of closets. One historical society had some really enterprising staff member or volunteer who had taken big blueprints and put them in kind of accordion folds and clothespins on hangers and put them in a closet. So there's a whole closet of these. We found another cache of them in a Conestoga wagon that was in an outbuilding uh, where the uh, historical society exhibited all of its farm implements. You know, they really didn't know what to do with them. And this is something we still struggle with. So I was delighted. I was enthralled with them. But I soon discovered there was a real hitch to being able to work on them and take care of these fabulous things. In examining them for treatment, I kept seeing things I just didn't understand. You know, there are these strange, you know, whoop, pin prick holes here, thinned areas, bizarre reproductions, you know, kind of glazed fabric with drawings on it. I had no idea what this was, and in conservation, you can't just move forward to really thoroughly understand the chemistry and technology and context in which objects were created. So for every beautiful, familiar drawing executed in watercolor on paper, there were stacks of working drawings on this fabric, mounds of images on tracing paper, and all these mysterious copying processes. And with the exception of blueprints, they didn't really resemble anything that I'd studied in my coursework on historic photographic processes. So I went to all the secondary sources I could find, and I found precious little about the materials and techniques that architects have used in the 19th and 20th century. So, my next bright idea was to interview the architects. I thought they, they should be able to tell me what they were using. So since the architectural archives at Penn was a client, which is also where the Louis Kahn collection resides, um, I talked to the director there, and she arranged for me to meet with some of the particularly emeritus faculty, some of them really wonderfully well known, and they were delighted to talk to me about their work, but totally disinterested in my questions. Um, I heard about commissions won and lost, competitions, who'd screwed them out of a job, who they had bested, um, but questions like, you know, what tracing papers did you use? How did you decide which one? Um, what's the coating on this cloth? 
Uh, how did you copy your drawings? Blank stairs. I used whatever was available. We sent them out to be copied and they came back. So I was profoundly disappointed after that. Um, they were just seen as unimportant ephemera, just a means to an end. The building was clearly what mattered. Even the most beautiful rendering, um, I mean, this is gorgeous. It's no more than a sales document. Since the drawings were only a means to an end, um, architects and rooms full of drafters took full advantage of any technology that would speed the process. Time was money, literally. Or produce a more alluring sales document. Long-term durability was simply not an issue. So the architectural drawings had become ephemeral in both form, you know, they really weren't important because the building was it, and function. Um, mm, they really, you know, they were, they were made for short-term use. And their condition certainly reflects that. So during their useful life, they were tacked on walls, dragged to conferences and presentations, sent on multiple trips through copying machines, enrolled and unrolled numerous times. Blueprints and photo reproductions were considered totally expendable in treating accordingly during the construction process. Following exposure at the construction site, if a drawing or print survived this long, it was discarded or rolled and folded for storage um, in some out of the way corner of an architect or contractor's office. A few lucky drawings or prints might be consigned to those uh, in charge of maintaining a building where they'd be used and basically used up. It's extraordinary how many inches of tape can be applied to a single torn drawing by a well-meaning facility staff. Then if an architectural drawing or print was really lucky, it was deposited in a library archives or historical society. We've already talked about what we were finding there. The institutions that often have very limited resources to care for large, complex, tattered, torn, stained, and misunderstood artifacts. So this was sort of the, the, the state of the situation um, in, by, in the late 1980s. And so this is how the research began that really resulted in the book. You know, I went looking for information that wasn't there, and being somebody who really doesn't like knowing something, it's taken me a few decades to figure it out. So encouraged by the directors at the Conservation Center in the Athenaeum in Philadelphia, which is a major repository for whom uh, the Conservation Center was doing a lot of work, I applied for my first research grant and took a leave from work. So over the period I applied, I wrote 12 grant proposals, had five of them funded, uh, it gave me salary support and some very limited time for travel. So fortunately, my background in undergraduate, as an undergraduate history major and the research methodologies I learned previously studying um, American material culture really served me very well. And so I could go to the primary sources that I thought would begin to give me the answers I needed. So I started with trade catalogs still a passion and absolutely one of the most wonderful things you find in collections that basically have lots of ephemera. So they were produced for um, architects. This one just for artists. This is from the mid 1840s. This one for uh, architects, uh, 1885. They would tell me what was being sold to architects. Their little spiels would tell me how things were supposed to be used, whether it was a new product, and when you kept looking at the same product over the decades, you could see when it was introduced, when it kind of reached its height, and there were multiple variations, and then when it disappeared. So it started to give me a sense of what was available when and how and why it was being used just from reading these trade catalogs. And then there were manuals and design books um, by architects and their predecessors, the master builders who were mostly just design books, and they would tell me, to some extent, how these materials were used. The early builders and so on assumed everybody knew. The later manuals um, for like adult schools, night schools, technical schools as they developed were much more helpful in terms of giving you credible information. There were lots of 19th century manuals and photographic materials. They described a myriad of amazing processes. Why? These guys must have all died early of various kinds of chemical poisoning. They were incredibly innovative and daring, but they were just, they were crazy. But I knew some of these processes actually became and developed as uh, what became the repographics industry, what are generically known as blueprints. It was just a matter of figuring out which ones, because they tried everything. Um, Histories of architectural education and the architectural profession helped put 
what I was learning about all the materials, processes, and architects and context, and finally the architectural drawings, just provided examples of materials and techniques that I could then work through and begin to match to the descriptions I was finding in all of the other primary sources. We were also able to use analytical um, techniques to look at the chemical composition of many of the copying processes in the media, which is also immensely helpful. So that's kind of how it all began. And then we look, what did I discover? I you know, kind of go on for a long time, and you all would be falling asleep and very hungry. Um, but since I haven't been charged with any profound didactic duty today, that comes tomorrow, um, I'm just I'm going to talk about some of the disparate parts of my research that I found really particularly interesting. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about how the development of the architectural profession was reflected in their choice of media and materials. And then I'm going to introduce you to some of the mysterious copying processes. So, in considering the architectural profession, basically in their graphics, we basically have to figure out how we got from this. This is sort of about 1780-ish. Uh, there was a one-page uh, of written specifications that accompanied this. Um, said they had to use good, good wood. Um, they wanted windows and the number of lights and they wanted a nice um, pediment that was contemporary over the door. And that was it. And this was not uncommon if you had drawings at all to this. Thomas U. Walter, one of my absolute favorite architects and renders, who uh, did the extension in the dome of the US Capitol um, from about 1860. So in the space of a century, we got from this to this. How and why? So early architectural drawings basically are going to reflect, reflect the evolving role of the architect. Who is this profession replaced the master builder, who had been responsible since the 17th century, and obviously before that in Europe, for making simple drafts as necessary for construction. Um, if you look at the Carpenters Company of Philadelphia's uh, price list from the 18th, late 18th century, there are pages and pages of detailed prices for construction, because this is how they got paid. And then finally, the only mention, the making of drafts according to the trouble is sort of an afterthought. It gives you some sense of how important drawings were towards the end of the late 18th century, not very. As the 19th century progressed, however, the traditional builder became less able to deal with new styles and building technologies of increasingly complex mechanical systems. And a changing public attitude towards architectural drawings. And this opened the way for the, a new profession, that of the professional architect. Uh, but its birth in the US was neither quick nor easy. Mm -hmm. And if you have ever had the opportunity to read, we'll get into particularly Benjamin Henry Latrobe's memoirs and accounts and correspondence, um, you get a real picture of the battle that it was for them to gain recognition. But here we see uh, two engravings. It's sort of the architect's idealized view of himself. Mm -hmm. This is an 18th century um, British engraving, and this a uh, mid-19th century American. Now, the profession developed earlier in Britain than it was than it did here. But what you see in common in both of them, uh, the architect appears in frock coat, or top hat, and in the general guise of a gentleman, and he's there to discuss his drawings with the client who is presented as his peer, and provide interpretation of the drawings for the respectful carpenter builders in their shirt sleeves. In both instances, the drawings are the crucial defining attribute of the architect, and this continued to be true right through a mid-19th century lawsuit that finally established the architect's ownership of drawings done for a client as his intellectual property, which they had not been before then. So they were that finally considered more akin to a composer's score rather than a commodity like bricks or lumber of a building that became And this was critical and very much a found part of the founding of the American Institute of Architects. So the drawings are critical. They're really the defining attribute at this point. <coughs> okay, so early American drawings executed by master builders were composed of these thin, uniformly inked ruled lines, and generally done to a small scale that included very little detail. Mm, here's a uh, mm, mm, uh, framing diagram for a mill and a typical townhouse. Uh, could be Philadelphia, could be Baltimore. Um, some included dimensions and indications of material, many didn't. Decisions like the profile of moldings 
trim around windows and doors, design and direct decorative brickwork. They're all left to the discretion of the builder or made during the construction process to informal consultation. So this is what we see all during the 18th and into the 19th century. And this abbreviated design process was possible because of the nature of 18th and early 19th century aesthetic assumptions and building practices. Construction technology for all kinds of structures was based on traditional building practices, and it didn't require a lot of explanation between the parties involved. It's basically vernacular architecture. <clears throat> it was guided by traf craft tradition and you know, slowly evolving forms. The design principles that guided more formal Georgian and federal architecture were based on Palladio's theories of symmetry and hierarchy and enriched with classical details drawn from the multitude of design books that emerged in the 18th and 19th century, often in the hands of a client who may have made the grand tour and been considered himself something of a scholar in the process. All this began to change in America by 1800 with the work of Benjamin Henry Latrobe, see one of his um, commissions here on the left, it's actually a penitentiary in um, Virginia. He was a fully trained English architect who routinely produced these sophisticated perspective drawings with surrounding landscape rendered in full color. Beside his drawings, the work of Native American builders appeared very naive, but traditional attitudes and practices changed slowly. Master builders resisted the intrusion of the architect into their domain since architects claimed not only the right to design a building, and this is key, but to also supervise the construction. This practice adversely affected the builder's profit and reduced his social status. So you can see why this was a real dogfight. In urban areas like Philadelphia, where competition was keen and major builders more complex local practice changed much more rapidly than in smaller, more conservative and rural areas. Professional architects, many trained by Latrobe, <clears throat> or dominated the design of public buildings and competitions like those for Girard College. Mm, see here, and Thomas U. Walter actually won that competition in 1833. And the exhibition of architectural drawings of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts after 1810, and of competition drawings throughout the U.S. from that decade onward, really elevated the perception of architects and architectural drawings in the public consciousness from a functional necessity to an art form. And it really increased the aesthetic expectations of the public in a manner traditional builders just couldn't meet. Mm. So then in the 1830s, with the emergence of the architectural profession, though certainly still not well established, but emerging, the design and construction functions became increasingly separate, and fewer decisions were left to the discretion of the builder and related craftsmen. With changes in style and technology and craft practices, the assumptions that had united the master builder and client in kind of a single vision of construction and design really didn't exist anymore. So the introduction of historically correct styles beginning with the Greek revival made the design of every detail increasingly dependent on the superior knowledge and taste of the architect as expressed in his drawings. Therefore, in addition to making presentation drawings for the client, architects began to execute detailed construction drawings for the builder. It might include window framing, um, which we see up here, and uh, you know, ventilation systems, sashes, heating systems, and other decorative elements. And unlike the informal sketches we saw earlier, you know, of mill framing, um, these drawings were executed to scale on really nice quality paper, neatly inked in, and then tinted with color. And these actually, what you're seeing here, are copies that were bound into multiple volumes by the firm of George Dexter and then his successor, Nathaniel Bradley, in Boston. And they were collectively from 1836 to 1886, and there's volume after volume of their drawings in the Boston Athenaeum. And they illustrate the degree of detail provided as well as the finish, even of these office copies um, that were drawn, inked, and rendered in watercolor on really nice handmade. So how did the emerging architectural profession's perception of itself influence the choice of materials and techniques? Now we have a little bit better understanding of how they thought of themselves. Well, going back, coming forward again, papers of the 18th and early 19th century fall into three major categories. We have writing, printing, and wrapping. 
Now, writing papers, like the ones you see here, were strong and well-sized. They allowed the quill of a pen to glide freely over the surface of the paper. And because of the sizing, it, the paper would absorb just enough ink, but without spreading, as it would if you did it on unsized paper, like a blotting paper. Since both artists and builders' drawings were relatively simple exercises, as you can see with just pen and a little watercolor, um, any paper considered appropriate for writing was also good for drawing. Though you do find particularly um, construction details and so on sometimes sketched out on wrapping paper. But this the indifferent attitude towards drawing papers again began to change in the late 18th century about the time Latrobe began his practice and brought with him his British training. In the larger artistic sphere, the British had begun to develop watercolor as a much more sophisticated um, artistic technique. Before then, it had just been used for, you know, tinting drawings, something that young ladies learned at school. But the watercolor technique began to grow and become more, much more technical. And it really revolutionized the medium and required a much more sophisticated support in order to allow them to do the things they wanted to do with watercolor. So the technical demands of the new watercolor methods resulted in papers designed specifically for watercolor work. So the need for these specialized drawing papers was most successfully addressed by handmade English papers from the Wattman Mills. Uh, Wattman papers become a standard of excellence, certainly for artists and watercolorists, and I found for architects. Uh, Wattman paper, re they re maintain their preeminence because of their exceptional quality, and Wattman's ability to develop a surface texture and sizing that could stand up to the kind of abuse that watercolor artists and architects um, gave their drawings as they were producing them. The papers could be dampened and stretched on a drawing board, so they dried nice and taut and didn't cockle. Then dampened and dried again through repeated campaigns of applying, softening, and lifting washes. Sometimes they actually would hose off what they'd done so only the smallest particles remained on the paper and build up these wonderfully luminous layers that you see, particularly in the later 19th century. And while less expensive machine-made papers were introduced as the century progressed, artists, architects consciously chose the paper used by artists for their most important drawings, particularly competitions and commissions. And again, this was a statement as well as the function of the drawing. And you just find, you know, this watermark which appears along the edge over and over and over again um, on architectural drawings. Um, this prevalence is really quite, quite amazing. In fact, Thomas U. Walter, um, the mid-century architect of the capital would use nothing else you find in his correspondence. He complains bitterly to his supplier when he can't get what he wants. And we saw Dexter and Bradley using it for office copies. And in the 1920s, there were still advertisements for it in the trade literature talking about it as the standard of excellence. Okay, like paper, the architect's choice of ink changed significantly in the opening years of the 19th century. Previously, uh, iron gall ink, was, which was the commonly used writing ink, was the most available medium. Now, iron gall ink had been used since the medieval period and before. Uh, it's composed of iron sulfate, also sometimes called cuprous, um, tannic, gallotanic acid, which was drawn from gall nuts, and usually some gum arabic as a binder. And this combination actually began as a really wonderful, rich, blue-black ink that bonded beautifully to the paper. And early drawings by carpenter builders were all executed in iron gall ink. And it continues to appear in drawings and notations well into the 19th century. Uh, people like Jefferson, which you see here in the bottom right, used it exclusively for the architectural drawings, such as those he did for the University of Virginia. But we're used to seeing it very brown and sometimes a little fuzzy because it will actually bleed, uh, particularly when it's exposed to moisture in ink or watercolor washes um, when it's relatively fresh, which is what you see happening up here in this attempt to deny on a capital. With the increased availability of classes and drafting and the publication of builders' manuals, which spelled out exactly how drawings were to be done, um, mm, common practice began to change and black carbon-based ink became the standard medium for drafting by about 1830. And India ink, also referred to as China or Japan ink, came in solid sticks, which is those you see, you know, advertised here, and then was ground in a slate <coughs> pad like this, so you got the right consistency and density of ink for what you needed to use it for. 
It's composed of lamp black, which is a really fine carbon pigment, and a gelatin binder. And it was highly valued for these dense lines and really luminous washes you could do with it, produce with it. And be, it, like the paper, became the mark of the rising profession because they knew how to use it and they knew it was uh, the material of artists. And this is sort of a transitional drawing where you see the, um, the lines were inked in in an iron gold ink, which is turned brown, but the washes, the ink washes, were put in with an Indian ink. Now, originally, you think of those lines as a deep blue-black. <clears throat> now, after a drawing was inked in, the drafter had the option of continuing to develop the image by adding shadows, monochromatic shades and tints, or local color. And this, too, is a clear change from earlier practice and depended on knowledge of more sophisticated drafting and watercolor techniques. And the addition of properly cast shadows was considered a particularly important part of an architect's toolbox. And in an elevation, it also increases the information in the drawing by defining the depth of various projections. You couldn't just guess at these. They actually had to be very carefully laid out. <coughs> Then the addition of monochromatic tints and shades increased the clarity of the image. And local color suggested the materials to be used in the structure. And all of these elements increased the visual appeal and artistic appearance of the drawing, which, remembering back, is also a marketing tool. It also helps, um, this is a perspective drawing, which they started doing, which is fairly easy to read visually. But elevations, which were more common, without the addition of shadows and tints and so on, can be very difficult for the uninitiated to figure out what's coming forward, what's moving backwards. Uh, this it really helped a client visualize the final project. It was a good sales tool. And it was available only from an architect. And as you had this progression of revival styles, which they wanted to be correct, historically correct, again, it was the architect who could deliver these and show you how it would look through a drawing. So the progressively sophisticated use of these elements from the late 18th through the mid-19th century then paralleled the growing sophistication and professional consciousness of the architects as they were making that transition from the uh, craftsman builder. Now just briefly, tinning is the practice of applying these flat washes um, <coughs> of varying strength without reference to light. So shapes in the foreground are generally lighter, and then as the receding planes get progressively darker. They also had to learn to do flat and graduated tones, which were prescribed to be done in very specific ways. And then you would lay local color over these ink washes, and we'll see what the effect was on drawings. So color was the final consideration of the architect in completing a rendering, and watercolor was almost always the medium of choice. Now, in the standard technique of the 18th and early 19th century, colored washes were just laid in over much more complex washes executed in varying dilutions of India ink. So you laid out all your different, your design, all your different tonal gradations and so on in ink, and then just put a light wash of color over it. The final picture basically was more of a tinted drawing than a painting. And the ink washes really muted the local color and gave the overall composition kind of a subdued tone. And this was in practice with what watercolor drawing had been in the 18th and the first part of the 19th century. Then consistent with art artists working in watercolor and the way they developed later in the 19th century, they began to apply watercolor much more directly uh, with less use of the preliminary ink washes. And these created much livelier renderings, but they were careful not to compromise the clarity of the design. I mean, they still had this primary function. I mean, this has been all dolled up, but it's basically an elevation. But because of what they've done working around it, it's much easier to read if you're a client. Then as architectural design became more business-oriented in the decades after 1860, and this is sort of an idealized architect's office from the early 20th century, Architectural practices changed from, you know, just the architect and a couple journeyman apprentices to large offices where you had business managers, drafters, construction supervisors, engineers, and all sorts of specialized positions to deal with increasingly complex buildings and financial arrangements. And this change also reflected, you know, the complexity of all the systems in buildings. Mm -hmm. 
we had gas, we had electric, we had ventilation, we had all kinds of terracotta work, there was structural <laughs> iron. Um, you know, think of all the increasing numbers of trades who needed all this graphic information. So architects and successful firms saw themselves increasingly as businessmen. Mm. And working drawings became very utilitarian, executed by small armies of draftsmen. But the presentation and competition drawings still continued to reflect the public aesthetic and were done with the best quality materials. So as you know, the time is money becomes increasingly uh, significant. Ink brown from sticks tended to be used only for highly finished drawings, uh, primarily for presentation or competition. And architects, architects turned more and more to the labor-saving bottled inks. Um, they were routinely used for pen and ink drawings and working drawings, as you see here from a uh, pencil point, which was a uh, 20th century uh, mm, periodical for architects. You know, Stop grinding in the ink, you know, buy Higgins. And the lamp black, the Higgins ink was formed of lamp black, shellac, and borax, and it continued to be the foundation of many inks, so they all developed their own inks with their own little proprietary additives. <coughs> it also moved on to three bottled colored inks and premixed colors that replaced the traditional watercolor palette in lots of working drawings. You see here we don't even have colors. We have cast iron, wrought iron, steel, leather, light wood, dark wood. Um, mm for the most part, rather than the individual pigment names, which is what we would have had earlier. Then we have the airbrush, time is money, appeared in trade catalogs about 1880, which surprised me. It was much earlier than I thought. And architects quickly developed specialized techniques that took advantage of its labor-saving properties. And you can get it with uh, a little motor. He's, whoops, he's, this guy's actually using a little foot pedal down here. And they developed colors for airbrushes that were often based on dyes and an alcohol carrier that reduced clogging and also made it dry faster so you could build up your layers. And renders continued to use watercolor washes, but often in new and labor-saving, time-saving ways. <coughs> and this is one favorite technique that involved rendering the building in an ink or monochrome watercolor and then developing the surroundings in full color and you get this really dramatic silhouetted effect um, with much reduced labor. And they also got to the point that they didn't ink in very carefully with dilutions of ink all the lines, but actually rendered over graphite. <coughs> so they also faced the increasing need to market themselves, to have their work published. You know, as these firms got bigger, they <coughs> needed to be able to seek commissions well outside their immediate geographic area. And again, drawings reflected this. Uh, after the decades after the Civil War, you see them turning more and more to pen and ink drawings, and they became really prevalent. Um, and there were reasons for that. Um, primarily, they were publishable. Using existing photomechanical printing processes, these black and white linear designs allow easy publication in the emerging professional journals, like the Architect and Builders News and the Inland Architect. Um, you could publish black and white lines. Um, you really couldn't do halftone until the turn of the century it was after 1900 <coughs> into the um, tens when you start to see the ability to, they were a little muddy, but you had halftone drawings that could then reproduce to some degree watercolor. And that's about the time we really see the ascendancy of the Beaux-Arts tradition, uh, both in the work architects did and in the education of architects. Uh, and it led to still another change of attitude towards drawings and the way they were executed. Mm. The first American architect to study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts was Richard Morris Hunt, who returned to the U.S. Uh, about 1860 and set up his own atelier where he started training uh, students. This was a change from the traditional internships that they would had before that. And the design principles of the Ecole became increasingly influential and they strongly informed the first university-based schools of architecture. The Ecole teaching model relied heavily on the esquisse, that is design exercises solved through beautifully executed renderings and characterized by detailed, fully inked drawings with sophisticated ink and watercolor washes. And in fact, in going through the archives here this afternoon, we found some examples of student work that were very much in the Ecole tradition um, from Syracuse. 
And this style really suited the emerging neoclassical buildings that replaced the angular and highly textured structures of the Victorian period and brought architectural drawings to a new pinnacle of finish and complexity. And this is one of the largest drawings I've ever worked on. It was about 8 by 10 feet, and it was an archaeo, um, a measured drawing produced by Harry Sternfeld, who was the winner of the Rome Prize in 1821, uh, oh, went to Italy and did this measured drawing of the Savita Castellana. Um, and when you look at it, this is not real gold leaf. It's actually what we call Dutch gilded. It's, whoops, it's copper um, alloy here. But it's pretty spectacular. But the um, and you can see the watercolor works really exquisite. They, you, they would mix their pigments so you get these deposing pigments that would actually get the speckled effect to imitate stone. Uh, which pigments you mix together, how quickly you led your wash across the paper. There are all these amazing variables that were used to get these exquisitely detailed effects on a really, really large scale. So meanwhile, back at the architect's office, and those of innumerable associated crafts, the business of grinding out the hundreds of drawings increasingly necessary to construct complex buildings continued. One major bottleneck in the flow of critical graphic information needed to coordinate these large projects was the need to produce accurate copies in a cheap and timely way. So we are now going to the sublime, to the, from the sublime to the mundane, but the mundane is really important. And copying process is imagine you've got all these crafts, you work on graphic information. How do you get them this information? How do you get them all these drawings and copies? Well, copying was a big issue from the very beginning. And in early on, I finally found out what all these little tricks were. I kept finding them drawings. So there was this protracting needle, and you would take your original drawing, put it over another sheet, and poke holes through it to mark all the main points, and then basically connect the dots, looking at raking light coming in so you could see where they were. Um, you would trace it through various renditions of um, carbon paper. Uh, and once they developed more translucent supports like tracing paper, you could then trace them directly. And trace them they did. And that became the primary means of copying after the Civil War as they needed more and more drawings and copies. Uh, and tracing cloth, that coated fabric I kept finding, was the other item that was introduced for this. There are innumerable craftsmen in large cities who spent their days, many, many hours, very long days, doing nothing but tracing architectural drawings. There were sweatshops of immigrants. So you can imagine very often these drawings were neither timely nor accurate since you had people copying them who didn't have a clue what they were looking at. So what did architects do? They experimented with hectographs. And this is one where you would use a soluble ink that would, could then be soaked into a graph made of plaster or clay and then you could pull multiple copies from it. But that was really pesky and hard to draw with and smeared easily. They tried traditional photography. This is an albumin print. Um, but again, it was too small. You know, it wasn't full scale. It wasn't detailed enough. It was expensive. You needed dark room and lots of chemicals to do it. <coughs> so the introduction of the blueprinting process, originally called the ferroprussiate or cyanotype process in the late 1870s, absolutely revolutionized uh, the production of architectural drawings and significantly affected the practice of architecture because you could make the copies you needed to facilitate the coordination of these large and complex projects. How do blueprints work? Well, you first do a drawing, and this one's on a translucent fabric, um, commonly referred to as linens, though they very quickly after that, very early on, switched to cotton because linen would have these slubs, and when you went to copy it, um, those slubs could end up in critical areas that would you know, make some part of the design indistinct. They're exactly the same size and they're produced by contact print, which I'm going to go into more in a little bit. But this is, you know, original drawing blueprint. <coughs> so the blueprint process was rapidly followed by a myriad of other processes, almost a dozen of which received widespread commercial application. The blueprint was the generic term used to apply to all these processes, no matter what color they were. And these processes come in blue, black, brown, lavender, maroon, and on almost every kind of paper, <coughs> tracing paper, tracing cloth. 
and then later on plastic support acetate and mylar. The period between 1880 and 1930 was one of absolutely intense innovation and resulted in the formation of a whole new industry and the introduction of countless new products related to the photo reproduction of drawings. To give some sense of the scope, by 1900, William Cramp and Sons, they were major ship and engine builders in Philadelphia, were using 11,000 square feet of blueprint paper for each sort of average size ship that they built. I mean, the, the quantities were pretty staggering. So this is sort of the trail of these mysterious copying processes. To say my search took me to the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site in Brook Lawn, uh, Massachusetts. And this was the site of um, Olmsted's original drafting office and home, which had been preserved by the National Park Service. And it's all still here. It's pretty extraordinary. Remember that early idealized view of an art office, I showed you all those nice windows, nice space. Well, here's the drafting office there. It's pretty dark walls. They all smoke like chimneys. The walls are all this dark wood. Um, mm, these are the bins, cloth bins where they stored drawings. And this was the staff at one point, April 1930. <coughs> so printing was accomplished using wooden contact printing frames with plate glass fronts. And so looking at it, and they were, the early drawings were done using the sun. If you look at lots of those wonderful late 19th century, early 20th century lithographs of cities, very often you'll see these, once you know what to look for, these frames jutting out of windows. You know there's a drafting office there when you see that. So here's the frame, you'd have the glass. Um, face down on the glass you would have um, your drawing. Then behind it, a sensitized paper. Behind that, a felt and a backboard in some way to have nice, even pressure across the entire space, because any place you didn't have really good contact, the image would be blurry. And so you had these large ones that could be wheeled out the door. You had these you know, that you would actually send out the window. And these are the ones at Olmsted. So very large tracings could only be copied by wrapping both the tracing and the sensitized paper around a large cylinder. And you'd wheel it out, if you were the worker, and actually turn it like meat on a spit to get even exposure from the print. And you had to really guess at the exposure because depending upon the formulation of the sensitization material on the paper, it changed the speed and how bright the sun was. And if you had a hurry up project on a cloudy day, you were just out of luck. And they complained in London about what a problem it was because it's smog and trying to produce blueprints. However, ingenuity wins out. By 1900, uh, there were machines that could make blueprints as well as other types of prints. And you could use an arc lamp here, which you could be raised and lowered inside this glass cylinder. And again, the glass cylinder, you would have your drawing and then your sensitized paper wrapped around the outside of it and secured with a canvas curtain. Because what's happening here, and then you have these machines that, um, you know, could go ahead and expose, wash, develop, and even dry eventually mm. your uh, blueprints very quickly. So they needed faster and faster machines. And the reason they went to this trouble, and I'm going to show you here, is the uh, printer that is still resident at the Olmsted site. It's very hard to get a good picture of, but you see the glass cylinder here. Here's the arc lamp and the wiring that goes up and down. And then this little, little claustrophobic room, this is the sink, and this is where all of the developing is done. And they had, they did a lot of work here. It must have been quite the environment. So even though blueprinting companies developed that had these elaborate machines, many firms, particularly larger ones, would maintain their own in-house printing facilities. And you see these ads that make it clear why. Uh, and you find these correspondence, you know, about what happened to this competition or this commission. We couldn't get the prints, we couldn't get the drawings, and we screwed it up and they were worried. Um, so this, this was a big deal. So now you know a little bit how the prints were made. 
Um, and I can talk about the photographic manuals then was to match the print with the process so I could identify the media and understand the chemistry and recommend appropriate treatment and storage. So these processes all have three things in common. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the light sensitivity. They all depended on the light sensitivity of certain iron, silver, um, chromate, or diazo salts. These are all things that for one reason, the way the atoms, molecules are set up when they're exposed to light, they undergo changes. And these changes, you, they opportunistically took advantage of in order to produce these drawings. The silver works the same way. Silver nitrate has specific properties that allow it to change states and create an image. Um, now, they're all done by printing out processes. We're used to developing out process, you know, you used, well, we don't anymore, but you used to shoot film. You couldn't see anything until it was developed. If anybody's ever stood in a dark room watching a negative come up, you're familiar with it. Printing out processes, you get an image, or at least a latent image, a light image, immediately. And it can only be done by contact print. Same size, same size. We're used to thinking of negatives that are small, which can then be enlarged. Now, when the salts are exposed to light, they all, <clears throat> the um, uh, iron, silver, chromate, or diazo part of the compound changes chemically in a manner that lets it react with other substances, either directly or indirectly, and forms a visible image. The image may be positive or negative. It depends upon the process and the original. Is the original drawing, you know, lines on a translucent support or vice versa? And depending upon the process and whether the original translucent print um, <clears throat> was really clear and nice, you may get a really good print. If it was really aged and beat up, you can get a really bad print. So I found my ally in trying to match up all these recipes I've gotten from manuals and all of these different kinds of prints that I found and faced coming in from different institutions um, using X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, which is um, a process, an <coughs> analytical process that used to take up a whole room. Now it's down to this little portable thing that we can take around and people use a good deal. Basically what it does is tell you what elements are present. So for instance here, here's a blueprint. You know this is an iron-based process. <gasps> and there's an iron peak. So I could take these various samples of these various processes, drawings that I found. We could do x-ray fluorescence spectroscopy on them and find out what elements are present. And between the descriptions in the manuals and the recipes that told me what the chemistry was and the drawings, we began to be able to match things up. And there were a few other people at the Olmsted Historic Site and the um, <coughs> New York Botanical Gardens who were working on the same thing. And we all corresponded back and forth and compared notes regularly. There's also, there are also a couple of books. Um, this one by Ernst Leeds called Modern Heliographic Process. This was actually published in Cincinnati in 1888. And he tips in original samples of these with what they are. So we have a uranium print up here, which yes, we tried it. It actually is radioactive. Um, a couple negative images. Here's a silver uh, print on a chloro, <coughs> citrochloride paper, and this is a paper that could be treated so it could be, unlike most silver processes, it could be handled in dim light. And this is a Van Dyke print. So again, looking at these that had names and being able to match them back and forth was immensely helpful. Now the trade catalogs had all started getting them proprietary names, so each process might have multiple different names. So I had to figure out what all the trade names were also to begin to trace these things through the literature. So I'm just going to show you a few of them, just because they're great fun to look at. Um, this is a Van Dyke print, and this was a process that was used as a reproducible. So you would make a bunch of these from your original drawings, send them out to all of your contractors who could then make any number of sets of drawings for their subs. So you wouldn't be stuck making all of those and mailing them. You could also use this as a negative, and it was used as a negative a lot, to make a positive print. And here is a positive print. Made. So you have the three generations, original drawing, negative, use the negative, make the positive. And they like these for reproducibles because this is actually a silver-based process and silver blocked light really well. So you needed to block the light in some areas and have the light come through in these translucent design areas in order to react with the sensitized paper underneath and make an image. 
Photostat, <laughs> you fall. Who, who here remembers photostats? They're in collections. Again, it's a silver-based process. Instead of film, you actually have a sensitized, usually silver bromide paper in the back of your photostat camera. You usually produce a negative, though Kodak did come out with a direct positive paper. But you can then make a negative, rephotograph it, and get positive. And architects being the inventive people, they were figured out ways to put these on angles and project them against walls and make pretty good sized photostats. So we have those, and they often exhibit this kind of silver mirroring common to many silver-based processes. And then we have, this is another way of doing a reproducible. People wanted things that were as secure and permanent as ink. They knew and were aware that perhaps blueprints and Van Dyke's and those weren't as um, permanent. And that it was really dangerous to have just one set of drawings. You wanted to have copies of them in a couple of locations, because what if you had a fire or a flood? So this was one means where the image um, actually, instead of making a latent image, you would make a negative for the Van Dyke from the original drawing. And then the light would actually harden the sensitized emulsion on the surface. And you would wash off all the stuff that had been protected by the negative. So it was a wash off. And they have a very particular kind of um, grainy appearance. But it's important to be able to identify them because they can remain pretty water sensitive. <coughs> and then the auto positive, which you could print actually in your office, and you needed a, a, a red light and a yellow light to do it without going into the chemistry, you would find these um, boxes in an architect's office. And they could be really big. Um, you'd store your papers down here, there would be a bank of lights here, and this would be like a contact printing frame at the top. You'd close it, turn the lights on, time it, pull your prints out. And then finally, the big revolution um, in the late 1920s was the diazo print. And this was the first process that didn't need to be washed. Now what happens when you wash paper? It changes dimensionally, so you can't scale it up because the dimensions have changed. Diazo print could be processed with ammonia gas. And this early diazo print known as Ozolid, whoop, see them bragging about it here, this was an ad for it, tended to be really dark, you get this really dirty discolored background. Um, mm, but it was a real breakthrough. It could also reproduce pencil. Most of the other processes you need to go through the whole inking ordeal. Now you could actually reproduce pencil drawings, which you do. I mean, I'm sure why that one's so out of focus. But you see, you know, ongoing these, mm, this is from the 50s. And they come in all different colors. It depends upon what um, chemical composition they decide to use with the diazo salt. Any one of a number of different phenols can be used, and they have varying degrees of durability and different colors. And what I was looking at here is different degrees of water solubility, from highly soluble to doesn't move at all. They also published them. Uh, if you had a run of at least 20, it was viable economically to do photolithographs, which are really wonderful. And you find these used a lot for um, commercial purposes, for publicizing a project. This one's from the 1876 um, centennial celebration in Philadelphia at Machine and Hall develops, interacts with the gelatin and hardens it so that you can then ink it up the image areas with a lithographic ink, which doesn't like moisture, gelatin having moisture, and pull a print, or pull several prints. Again, who would have thought of it? They were really quite remarkable. So finally, coming to the, coming to the end, brings us full circle, you can see what things looked like as we kind of entered on this with a drawing of the latter part of the 18th century. Iron gall ink, very small, done on um, <clears throat> actually uh, wrapping paper in this case. Wonderful mid-century drawing, just after mid-century by Thomas E. Walter. And then finally, this really <clears throat> fun, this is actually a Palais print that was done for a housing development outside of Philadelphia <clears throat> around 1930. 
So that's sort of the saga of investigating architectural drawings. Some of the fun things I found out among many things. Uh, gave me a great appreciation for the profession and for the graphics they produced. Though I never have totally understood why they didn't just take better care of them and appreciate them more. But I guess that falls to us. So thank you very much and I'm happy to entertain any and all questions. Blueprints in books, you mean? Oh, the ones from the Boston Athenaeum? Yeah. yeah. No, those are kept in use. They're a little bit awkward to use, but it's such an unusual survival to have mm -hmm. the records of a single office for such a long period of time as they chose to file them and preserve them for their reference purposes. That mm -hmm. The Boston Athenaeum takes very good care of them. Stay. Yeah, those were all drawings. So they didn't find, they went up in the 1880s and there were no, they didn't have any reproductions, photo reproductions, and they were all drawings. So, of course, they moved from really lovely Wattman paper, and then after mid century, you see more and more inexpensive papers, the introduction of tracing cloth, tracing paper. So it's like a little time capsule of materials mm -hmm. over that whole mid 19th century period. Yeah, it was very cool. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I thought, I'm interested, I'm really interested in your argument about emerging professionalization and the role that drawings seem to play in making a case for professional work, um, But I, I think there's also a tradition that you didn't, at least mm -hmm. I didn't hear you speak to, um, which is uh, sort of early printed works, like sort of 17th, 17th century Renaissance mm -hmm. era printing. Know, editions of Vitruvius or Paul. Right. Mm -hmm. where you have these these drawings, and maybe they're not really not really knowing them that well. I don't know if they're sort of functional or if they're more the, the intent is to sort of uh, make an argument for the genius of particular architects. But they are they're process drawings. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if that kind of figures in in some way, or if architects sort of wrote or thought about that. They must have been conscious of, in some way of the fact that these sort of in process drawings. Could yeah, well, they did, and they, you know, you find, I'm a, all the way from like people like Chippendale who did all their drawings, Vitruvius, uh, Swan, you find this whole progression of designers who documented their work partly for publicity purposes, and you know, everybody goes back to them and pulls designs from them. And so you have, um, you know, lots of American uh, gentlemen working with their builders going back to, you know, Abraham you know, the British architect and so on, to pull design elements from them or sometimes, you know, whole elevations. So you, most of the ones in the British books were a bit much for the American, the American experience. But, you know, there certainly was this consciousness of drawing in Europe. And, but, and you had architects functioning in Europe in the 18th century and earlier much more than you did in the U.S. You just didn't have professional architects, except for occasional visits. One um, drawing I showed by um, Joseph Anderson, which was done for Whitehall in Maryland. It was really a fully finished architectural drawing, and it was 18th century, but it was a British architect coming here, doing the drawings, um, mm. working with construction and leaving. Mm. So it wasn't really until the trope that somebody came and stayed and you really began to get the development of professional consciousness in, in the colonies and the young republic. At, at the time of the Renaissance, you had relatively few drawings being made anyway. Right. And very often, the actual control of the structure of the building was done by a physical model. Mm -hmm. That could be present very much so. Uh, written contracts that we have from architects of the time, Vignol and others, show that they were required to be on the job site so many days a week. Mm -hmm needed to actually physically be there everything and in fact if you go to Italy today it's still that way it shows up on the on the job site eight o'clock in the morning an hour's worth of argument before anything so yeah this is what <laughs> do, and I make a drawing right there on the spot or on the mm -hmm. walls so you can go yeah. to the Capella Medici and you can see Michelangelo's drawings on the walls mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and in some collections you do find these sketches. Uh, Whitehall, there's some sketches that were done to show, okay, this is what I want this to look like, and this is what I want that to look like. It's just so few of them that survive. Many of them were, that we know and have are because they were made specifically for publication, so yeah. the architectural treaties and so forth. Right, we know the Carpenters Company in Philadelphia, for instance, has um, a wonderful collection of the design books, which belong to master builders mm. and architects, but it wasn't... In the American experience, there didn't seem to be, you know, they certainly knew a good deal and they certainly knew the tradition and worked from these design books and so on. But they didn't take it to the next stage and actually do the drawings and say, these drawings are how I define myself. Frank Lloyd Wright was one of the great American architects. He probably mm -hmm. was right at the end of the year and it's a new area. Do you have any experience with the, 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 all the work he did and how things oh, were yeah. preserved? Yeah. We even know what his favorite kind of tracing cloth was. Mm -hmm. He liked imperial tracing cloth, which was imported from um, from England. They still made the bed. There wasn't an American version, unfortunately, or not for very long. So, yeah, Wright was working very much, he very much was part of this tradition to the first part of the 20th century. It's when you, when you really hit the international style, you know, 1940, with a great influx of Europeans, a real change in attitude towards building, a real change in attitude towards drawings, mm, that you see big changes. And that's sort of where I stopped, partly, because <coughs> I had to stop someplace. And a lot of the um, products and so on were increasingly proprietary, and it was harder and harder to find out about them. So when did, when did we go from blueprints to whatever's used today with all the modern things? Uh, really, diazo prints came in by 1930. They began to replace blueprints. So you find blueprints up through the 1950s, sometimes later. I mean, we were looking at some things today and speculating what had happened with a commission that had been done um, out in what I assume is a small town in Minnesota, and thinking, you know, why are they using these? Why aren't they using diazo prints? And going, well, you know, maybe they just hadn't made that transition. They were comfortable with, they had the machinery, they had the chemistry for these processes, and they just didn't change. Is there yeah, it, xerography Large changed everything. Xerography. Yeah, very much so. So I don't know if it was my mind has died or something, but when I, when I was looking at any number of the diagrams of the finished house or building and mm -hmm. then the schema of the I couldn't figure them out. Is that on purpose, or is one an idea? Um, I'd have to look at, so when you saw the elevation, and then there was the floor plan below. Yeah, I couldn't put the floor plan into the elevation. Half the floor. Yeah, so half half the floor half the floor. Yeah. yeah, they were, pardon? It was the left half of the building that was wrong. Oh, right, for the townhouses, okay. yeah, because they were mirror image, okay. or duplicates, one or the other, but they did them both ways. Supposed to be doing some stuff on conservation here. Uh, what was your hardest conservation problem? What, like the Iron Gall? What, 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 what um, did you find out? I think the tracing papers are That's the biggest scary. challenge. Um, they're made several different ways. They can be impregnated with oil they, to make them translucent. They can be have really heavily beaten fibers. So the fibers break down and kind of gelatinize, or they can be made parchment-like by treating them with acid. Um, but particularly the first two um, just start out inherently weak and problematic, and particularly the impregnated ones, which are often usually the most translucent. Um, the oil is a drying oil, and they did use mineral oils, so those are another story, but most of them they use a drying oil, which becomes increasingly rigid as it ages. So they become really brittle, they're really hard to repair. Um, they can be hard to store as they become more brittle um, and handle. And so those are often the biggest, the biggest challenge. And most collections have great quantities of them. So what do you do? Well, it, it depends upon a number of factors. Um, you can always reformat them. Um, xerography, you know, if they can be used much more readily um, in a different format, that may be the best answer for them. And then you just store the originals unless somebody really needs to see them. 
Um, you can put them in polyester film mylar sleeves, which provides them with a great deal of support so they can be handled. They can be mended. In a pinch, um, if they really demand it, um, they can be lined. But again, you're talking about immense amounts of time for hundreds and hundreds. So a lot of it's a management issue. So how do I, and how much are they going to be used? And how are they going to be used? So you have to really set priorities. It's like a form of triage. And you have some iconic things that are borrowed and used all the time, and that's where you put a lot of really sophisticated treatment time. And then you have things that are primarily for research, um, and they're used maybe intensively for a period of time by someone doing research in that area, and then nobody looks at them again for a decade or two. So you do what you need to do to make them accessible safely. But they take up immense amounts of room. If we store each one in an individual enclosure, it can be very safely handled and used, but you would have to you know, triple the size of your storage space. So it's, it's, a, it's really a management. And that's one reason so many of them and so many collections were in such poor shape. They're really large. They're hard to handle. They're hard to copy. Um, and they're hard for many members of the public to read and understand. People come in and they want to see drawings in their house if you have them. And they often don't know how to read them. You're probably seeing pictures of our honeycomb storage system. Yes. I love it. Oh, good. OK. I was, I was oh. going to say, Joan, that's one answer to the question. Yeah. In, no. in the case of, say, Royer, we have thousands of drawings. <coughs> and that's just one of our architecture collections. So right. yeah, there's really our challenges to just in terms of scale. You do. And then you pull out these big rolls. And the drawing you really want to see is in the middle of the roll. So you have flat files. And the drawing you want to see is in the middle of the fat folder halfway down. So there's just a lot of handling and thoughtfulness about how you move things around that plays into being able to use them safely. I was curious whether it's any, you don't use any, I mean, the mylar and the, mm -hmm. that's all obvious in the question. But I was curious is whether you use any chemical, any soaking, any. It, any depending that. upon the image on the paper, or like tracing cloth. I found out the coating on most of those claws is starch. And if you wash it, it's gone. you know, you've basically got a handkerchief left. <laughs> uh, and they did do that. They would take them home and do that. Um, and other things are, you know, really sensitive to moisture. Some, like we talk, I talked about Wattman paper and the really wonderful watercolors they did. Aged watercolor, particularly if it's been done right, actually the gum arabic becomes less and less soluble. A lot of those drawings are incredibly forgiving in terms of withstanding immense amounts of treatment, you know, washing and cleansing and lining, mending, with no effect on the image. Um, you know, people always complain about conservatives. They ask the simple question, and we always go, well, it depends. <laughs> but, it, but it does. Yeah, that's why we delve so deeply into knowing the history and the chemistry and all about the materials, because making those decisions is really, you know, people think of the treatment, but it's really the decision making that's the heart of the, heart of the, mm, the activity. Yes, sir. Two, two points I would offer up. One, one would have to do with whether or not you are truly interested in that one drawing as a unique, one-of-a-kind mm -hmm. artifact, mm -hmm. in which case you're into full bore preservation. Right. Or whether you're interested in the content mm -hmm. of the drawing, which is just what it says. Which, which is where digitization and reformatting of. Right. It's easy. Right. Yeah. And it makes it available to lots of people without mm -hmm. ever having to touch the drawing. Right. But that keeps you away from the drawing as an artifact, so it's a crucial decision how, how you think of that drawing. Yeah, but we find that, you know, Thought digitization would do that, and you know, people have had board members say, "Well, you know, do we really, are we really need the library anymore? Won't everything be digital?" What we're finding is we make um, digital images more available. Use and demand for the original yeah. actually increases. It, the, the second point I was going to offer is that um, we saw a lot of what I would call final products, whether they were intended to guide the construction process or sell it mm -hmm. to the client. And very few of the internal work processes within the office, which were never intended right. to leave the office, yeah. and which tend to be the most fragile, right. because and they were under 
understood as temporary, very right. temporary. And I have lots of those. I chose for purposes of this talk, since I was told I was going to have you know, a very general audience, to give everyone some eye candy as well as you know, the, more, the more mundane things, which to the practice eye and an architect or a builder you know, are beautiful and speak volumes, but to the you know, average person looking at them is not as interesting. Talked a little bit about like a sort of co-evolution or parallel evolution of art materials and uh, architecture materials. Mm -hmm. I noticed a picture of a, like a reproduction machine mm -hmm. um, that reminded me of a, a screen, a uh, light sensitive screen printing technique. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if there was like a divergence or if they were constantly informing each other, the two fields over the century, over the centuries, yeah. or there's a, a specific point where they got so specialized that they really didn't really uh, talk to each other anymore. I think through, certainly through the first half of the 19th century, architects considered themselves very much part of the fine arts community and they exhibited their drawings with, you know, they had their own room and other fine arts exhibitions. As it became more of a business, I think there was a little less of that consciousness of being part of the fine arts community, though it's been kind of revived again much more during the Beaux-Arts period. But they certainly proved that they were very aware of what was happening in, you know, the art community. They couldn't, you know, take it, if you think of a Winslow Homer watercolor and his the way he takes advantage of the paper and the texture and working, you know, wet into wet and so on. They couldn't do that because the clarity of the image was so critical, but you see them using some of those techniques, particularly in the surrounding landscape and so on. So they were obviously very much aware of what was going on. And for the photoreproductive techniques, you do find some artists coming in and using mm, those same techniques. Though they tended to be much more used to find engineers using them, they got used for maps, but you don't find artists using them consciously. Some did, and I forget what your name, Woodhouse, first name, used diazo prints pretty extensively. And there were, you know, people along the way who took these different processes and used them, but not, not a lot. So like an art, uh, the artist's printmaking technique and the architect's printmaking technique eventually sort of separated. Right. I mean, most of the architects, print, these were not subtle. And these were, you know, they, they were there to get the job done quickly, as quickly and inexpensively as possible. I mean, there were architects, um, Wilson Air being one who loved the positive Van Dykes because he loved the, loved the, you know, the really nice brown, sepia, bronzy color the lines got. And he would render those and actually use those as his final drawings. They were actually prints. But he was more the exception than the rule. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you all very much. Thank you.